on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Nanapoku, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Shahidul Islam. Due to the commitments that he's had, our Vice Chancellor is unavailable and conveys his congratulations and best wishes to Professor Islam. Inaugural lectures form part of the university's public lecture series and may only be presented by newly appointed full professors who have been appointed in academic schools and centers. Inaugural lectures present an opportunity for showcasing the exciting and groundbreaking research and teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture represents a significant milestone in an academic's career, providing official recognition of their promotion or appointment to full professorship. These lectures are furthermore an ideal opportunity for new professors to introduce themselves and to present an overview of their own contribution to the field to academic peers, students, and research collaborators. Inaugural lectures are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievements with his or her family, friends, mentors, and colleagues. I would also like to acknowledge the following guests, the members of the executive management, the members of Senate, our inaugurant, Professor Islam, his family and friends, academics and professional staff, students, alumni, and distinguished guests. It is my pleasure to introduce our Dean and Head of School, Professor Ade Olaneren. Professor Olaneren will now formally introduce the inaugurant, Professor Islam. Thank you. Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Abad Modi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great privilege and honor that I introduce to you the inaugurant, inaugurant for today, Professor Shahidul Islam, um, who has been a colleague and friend over the years, and who has been appointed as a professor of biochemistry uh, within the School of Life Sciences at the University of KwaZulu Natal. My name is Ade Olaniro, and I am the Dean and Head of School of Life Sciences. Professor Shahidul Islam, completed his BSc honors and MSc degrees in biochemistry from the Department of Biochemistry, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh in 1997 and 1999, respectively. He went on to complete his PhD in nutritional science from the Graduate School of Natural Science and Technology, Okayama University, Japan in September, 2004. Subsequently, Professor Islam took on a postdoctoral fellowship position at the Seoul National University, South Korea, between 2005 and 2006, and then went on to do another postdoc at the Northwest University, Porchestro, in South Africa between 2006 and 2008. Recently, he has been a visiting research fellow at the Department of Biochemistry and Stem Cell Research National Institute of Nutrition, Hyderabad, India, and also as a visiting associate professor at St. Clara's Peter Hospital, Basel in Switzerland. Professor Islam started his academic career at the University of KwaZulu-Natal when he was appointed as a lecturer in November 2008, and, and, and subsequently moved through the academic rank over the years until his recent promotion to Professor of Biochemistry in August 2019. Currently, he is the academic leader for biotechnology cluster on Westfield campus within the School of Life Sciences in the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science. In terms of awards, Professor Islam has been a recipient of several awards over the years. Um, some of them include being a recipient of the Distinguished Teacher Award in 2015 from the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science. He also received top 30 research award uh, from the University of Kozunata 
in 2017 as well as 2019. I've testified to the top and, and excellent research that he conducts at the university. Professor Islam has also achieved a number of other awards from different professional bodies and societies, including the International Endocrine Society, Korean Endocrine Society, Japan Diabetes Society, Japanese Society for Surgical Metabolism and Nutrition, Pacific Science Association, as well as International Diabetes Federation, and many others in previous years. Uh, in terms of this research, Professor Islam's research focuses on the development of novel non-genetic animal model of type 2 diabetes and obesity. Its research involves investigating the anti-diabetic and anti-obesogenic potentials and underlying mechanisms of various anti-diabetic and anti-obesogenic drugs, medicinal and functional foods, sugar substitutes, and artificial sweeteners, medicinal plant extracts, fractions, and their isolated pure compounds targeting novel drug discovery. Prof. Islam is a rated researcher by the National Research Foundation of South Africa. Currently, he serves as a regular reviewer for more than 20 international peer-reviewed journals in his field of expertise. He is a member of the editorial board of five international journals, including Frontiers in Pharmacology and Drug Discovery, Food and Nutrition Report, Journal of Biochemical and Pharmacological Research, Recent Patents in Food, Nutrition and Agriculture, as well as World Journal of Diabetes. He also serves as the leading guest editor for two international peer review journals, which are Molecules and the Journals for Diabetes Research. Recently, Professor Islam was appointed as an editor in chief of the World Journal of Diabetes. So far, Professor Islam has published 10 peer reviewed book chapters and over 170 research articles in international peer reviewed journals. And this includes 10 reviews and one editorial since 2004. He has successfully supervised the research projects of three postdoctoral fellows, and he has graduated eight PhDs, seven masters, and 21 honors students over the years. He currently supervised uh, the project of four PhD students and three masters at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, his age index, according to Google Scholar, is 31. His I-10 index uh, of 83, and he currently enjoy a total citation of 3,732. Professor Islam has recently been included among the top 2% researchers in the world by Mendeley during 2019, and he has recently been classified among the top 0.1% researchers uh, that do research and publish in the area of experimental diabetes mellitus during 2021. It is a pleasure to invite uh, Professor Islam to please deliver his inaugural um, lecture. Hi. Uh, thank you, Professor Lenin, for your kind introduction and it's highly appreciated. And this afternoon, I think uh, DBC of College of the Agriculture, Engineering and Science and Vice Chancellor of the University, if attended, and other DBCs, deans from all the schools and colleges, my colleagues, my collaborators, my students, those who are graduated and those who I'm currently supervising and all protocols observed. I'd like to thank everyone on this particular session, on this particular afternoon, I think, uh, to join, to listen to my inaugural lecture. University created this opportunity for me, and I'd like to thank the university for creating this for me. And it is, a, I think this lifetime things happens in someone's life in academia. And I think many of you may be confused with my title of my talk this afternoon. And maybe I'm talking about the coronavirus because we are running a pandemic at the moment. But I think if you're thinking so, maybe you're getting it wrong. I'm talking about a pandemic that is also running and that is diabetes. So what is the area of my research? 
And if you think how it is related with Corona as well, if you saw in the newspaper, the news media in the recent uh, years, a couple of years, we're running the pandemic, the diabetic patients were highly vulnerable uh, uh, prepared to be succumbed by the coronavirus. So I think you can imagine how diabetes compromise our immune system. So that is why I think uh, I wanted to make my title like this. Let's talk about a, a, a pandemic that is neglected for many, many years. And people are not focusing on that particular area of research, especially on diabetes while it is a pandemic. And before I go to the lecture, I think, uh, let me tell you and how my lecture is designed. If you see, this is the content of my lecture for this afternoon. I think uh, I'll tell about who I am and how my childhood was passed and my undergraduate and postgraduate studies. And then how have I landed here in South Africa or in Durban? And then my research and publication, I can say our research and publication, including my students and collaborators and publication and student graduation, scholarship, fellowship, and other things. And then I think we'll go to the close of this lecture. So let me start with this to tell you who am I? And so the first thing, if you say I'm someone born in Bangladesh, you can say in Northern Bangladesh, I born in particularly, if you see the map of Bangladesh, if I zoom the map, it says, you can see some picture from my native village in Bangladesh. And if I zoom it, actually, actually I born in this particular area of Bangladesh, it's very close to India. If you look at the map of uh, this part of the world, if the Bangladesh is surrounded by India. I think India is three sides, and this side is the green part is the Myanmar. So I born in this district of Bangladesh, is very close to India in 1974. So then how, how about my childhood? If you look at that in those days, it's 1979 to 1984. I attended my primary school. The name is Dhanipar Government Primary School. And we, we are doing this kind of things every day in the school. If you see the picture here, when you are going to the school, we have to play for the country. For example, when you grown up, we'll serve for the country and we, we are placing every morning, we are determined for that. So that was happened. Then I moved to the high school and from that primary school in 1985 and 1990, exactly the same picture I put here, what you see, and that is my high school. Uh, in Kurigram district of Bangladesh, in Northern Bangladesh. And you can see this a bigger picture on the bottom side. So then as soon as I finished my high school or normally in Bangladesh, high school we called up to grade 10. After grade 10, we called it college. So then I moved to college in one of the famous colleges in the Northern Bangladesh is called Carmichael College and built by the British government in those days. And this, you know, the, this is one of the very famous colleges in the Northern Bangladesh. And it was not easy to get into that college. You need to go for admission test. And if you get a chance in that college, you should feel so proud. And I attended that, that college in science. And I attended, you know, as, as a normal student from high, uh, high school to college. And finally, I ended up that college with top 10 students in that college out of 375 students in the science, science group. And I would like to mention, I think I showed the picture of one of my teacher who helped me a lot during my college life, Dr. Hafiz Rahman. And I, this uh, last time I went to Bangladesh, I met him. And every time I go to Bangladesh, I try to meet him because he was working like my you know, guardian during that time when I was attending that grade 11 and grade 12. And finally, I completed the very good results in 1992. So as soon as I finished my High school, uh, college, I think then I moved to the capital of Bangladesh. And if you see, and that, that where I did my undergraduate study in 1992 and uh, 1997, and followed by my master's between 1997 and 1999. And if you see the, if you see on the map on the right top corner, and I born in the Northern Bangladesh, then I moved to the capital of Bangladesh. And these are, you know, so this also building that made during the British period in Bangladesh. And I was attending the, you know, my undergraduate study in biochemistry. And now the department is called biochemistry and molecular biology. And I, I'd like to mention on, one of the teacher who worked like in my, you know, another guardian in, in that department, it's Professor M. Rahman or Mustafizuran, 
I think during that time and who was with me until his death uh, in 2018 or sometime recent. And it, uh, when I went uh, in masters, I think I, I also put the picture of my supervisor of my masters, Professor Anwar Hussain, and who helped me to learn a lot of techniques in biotechnology. And I'd like to share with all of you this afternoon and Professor Anwar Wilson taught me about the plant biotechnology because he was a very famous lecturer in the area of plant biotechnology. And I was working with the plant biotechnology and particularly the rice plant. We are trying to develop some uh, submergence tolerance or flood tolerant rice plant during that time. And ultimately when I completed my master's, Bangladesh Rice Research Institute appointed me as my first position as a research assistant in the plant physiology division. But although you know, so I worked with the plant biotechnology, that was not my dream area of research. I wanted to do something for human. And that is why I wanted to be a, you know, so a master's student under a supervisor who did work in the food and nutrition. That was my dream area of research for the whole life. Then I think I moved from Bangladesh Rice Research Institute join a hospital as a biochemist, and that is called Hakka Community Hospital. And the chairman of that hospital is Professor Kazi Kamrujaman, and who helped me to grow during that time a lot in one or one and a half years time. But my intention was to do higher study in the area of nutrition. So that was my dream, I think for the whole life. So that is why when I was working in that you know, community hospital, then I was trying to get a foreign scholarship and finally, I got a scholarship from Japanese government in 2001, and then I left Bangladesh and went to Japan. And if you see that, these are the picture, if you see, if you, maybe you can see, this is my university life in the University of Dhaka. And if you see some of my picture here, if you, if you can see with uh, all of my friends here. And then what I did, and from Bangladesh in 2001, I left Dhaka Community Hospital and moved to Japan, the Okayama, Japan, and where I completed my PhD and then went to South Korea as a postdoc. And finally, I came to South Africa. I could not go anywhere and I'm still here. So how it was happened, for example, during that time, and if you see the PhD I did in the Graduate School of Natural Science and Technology and in Okayama University, Japan in 2001 and 2004, and this particular scholarship was so special. I had to complete my degree in three years time. So I, I did work in day and night and finally I completed my degree in three years time. Otherwise I had to pay myself for my study. And these are, you know, Professor Sakaguchi who also visited South Africa a few years ago. And these are the, some pictures if you see on the bottom. And when you are doing the surgery on animals together. So, and, uh, then I completed my PhD in nutritional science from the Okayama University. And then I came back briefly to my home country in Bangladesh and uh, you know, teaching medical biochemistry student for uh, I think six months in a med uh, private university. But I did not like the job because there's no research possibility. There's no fund for research and only teaching, but I was fascinated to do research. And that is why I tried to uh, get a postdoctoral fellowship from somewhere and I was trying all the times. And finally, I got one from the number one university in South Korea, and that is called Seoul National University and in the Department of Food and Nutrition. And I went to South Korea in 2005 and I did my postdoctoral fellowship until 2006 before I come back to, I came back to Northwest University in South Africa. And during that time, it's very interesting. I don't know whether Professor Lewis is uh, joining today, who was my postdoctoral supervisor. You can see the picture exactly underneath and who invited me to join, uh, to just uh, work on diabetes with the postdoctoral as a PhD student. And Lisa Bortz, I could remember her name. And then I left South Korea and came to South Africa uh, as a postdoctoral fellow in nutrition in the Department of Nutrition in the Northwest University. And if you see some picture here from my graduation time in Japan on the right hand side on the bottom and also some on the center. So after that, I think when I was doing this postdoctoral fellowship in Northwest University, my contract was for three years, but I was trying to get a permanent job somewhere because that was contract after three years, where should I go? 
So that is why I always try, I applied for jobs in many countries around the world and also in South Africa. And then that is why I want to say, how have I landed in Durban or uh, University of KwaZulu Natal? And in 2008, when I was trying to, when I was in the Northwest University, I was, I was trying to get a job in the different countries or different universities. And believe it or not, I got three jobs in one month. The first one, I got a postdoctoral position for two years in GC Medical University in Japan. And you can see the picture here. The second one, I got a research associate position in the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada. And then the last one in the University of KwaZulu Natal as a lecturer of biochemistry. And by this time, uh, my family was adopted here in South Africa and they are not interested to go anywhere because you, my child was adopted. So that is why finally we accepted this one, although we bought ticket to go to Canada, and but finally we did not go to Canada. We, uh, I landed up here and is still here. So I think uh, that's all about my background story. So let's talk about our research. Maybe all of you are waiting for this particular section of my talk. So what is my area of research? If you look at this slide, we basically work on these four different area of research. We develop animal model as mentioned by Professor Ulenaren. And we also do the anti-diabetic intervention trials for functional and medicinal food. And we also do the anti-diabetic intervention trials of medicinal plant extract fraction and the isolated pure compounds. And recently we started in this particular area, we're also doing the anti-obesity trial because of the rapidly growing obesity in South Africa. So that, that is our area of research, but I will focus mainly on the top two section and because of the time. And the first one, I think uh, all of you are waiting because I say the diabetes is a hidden pandemic that is running all the time, but what is it? What is diabetes? It's simply if we talk, diabetes is a complex metabolic disorder. And the main symptoms of diabetes is uncontrolled hyperglycemia. And if you're diabetic, you can't control your, uh, your blood glucose level and your blood glucose level is always high. So, and after that, it affects many other things. So that is why we call diabetes a multifactorial disorder, a multifactorial disease. And if you would like to see how to diagnose, for example, if you don't know whether you're diabetic or not, and how can you diagnose diabetes? I want to spend some time on this particular phase. Like if you're normal, your HbA1c will be less than 5.7 or 5.7, and your fasting blood glucose will be 99 milligram per deciliter of 5.5, or you know, the two hours after food or meal, it will be 139 or less than 7.7. .7. And exactly, you can look at the, if you're pre-diabetic, it will be 5.5 .5 to 6.9 is fasting blood glucose and 7.7 .7 to 11.1 if you are pre-diabetic. So, but if you're diabetic, then your fasting blood glucose will be greater than seven or 126 milligram per deciliter, and your two hours after uh, meal after glucose, it will be 11.1, greater than 11.1 .1 millimole per liter, or 200 milligram, uh, greater than 200 milligram per deciliter. So you can easily understand if this is the WHO criteria of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, uh, sorry, uh, all kinds of diabetes. So now, if we talk about the classification, the three different types of diabetes are mainly three different types of diabetes, but there's some other types of diabetes as well. The first one is, is uh, about five to 10% people are suffering from type one diabetes because of the, your pancreas. We got an organ in our body that is called pancreas, which can produce insulin to control the blood glucose level. But if we cannot control it, that is the reason because we can't produce sufficient amount of insulin because of the pancreatic beta cell failure. And that is on only five to 10%. And the type two is something like is a, is a heterogeneous disorder. For example, if you have two types of pathogenesis here, one is your insulin resistance. For example, you've got sufficient insulin, but it cannot work. And at the same time, your insulin producing pancreatic beta cell, it is partially dysfunctional. It cannot produce sufficient insulin as well. So that is about 90 to 95% people are suffering from uh, type 2 diabetes is also called non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. And gestational diabetes, the diabetes normally happens during pregnancy. So that is called gestational diabetes. There are some other types of diabetes. But my question here 
and why I'm working on this particular area of type 2 diabetes? The answer is very simple. As you see over there, 90 to 95% people are suffering from type 2 diabetes. And I want to do something that can help more people. So that is the intention of my research. That is why, and from the beginning, when I started my diabetes research in South Korea, I started to work on type 2 diabetes. And because most of the people are 90 to 95% people are suffering from type 2 diabetes. And if you would like to see the risk factors, like what are the risk factors and symptoms and complications of type 2 diabetes? If you see, these are the common symptoms, like you'll feel hungry, you feel thirsty, sometimes tingling on your hand or legs, your vision will be blurry, high blood glucose is the common symptoms. But I'd like to tell you, you will not see sometimes these symptoms. Some people are asymptomatic, even they're diabetic. So that is why it's recommended if somebody is more than 40 years old, if you want to confirm your type 2 diabetic, you, you have to go for oral glucose tolerance test. It's very important. And if you don't do so, even if you have no symptoms, but most of the times we get symptoms, but sometimes you may not have symptoms, your blood glucose is already high. So if we keep it like that, it can cause many other complications. If you look at it on the right-hand side of the slide, you may have complication like your nephropathy, your kidney problem, your cardiomyopathy is heart problem, neuropathy, brain problem, and diabetic foot disease, the you know, so your leg problem. So many kinds of things can be happening. So that is why is there anyone more than 40 years old or even below, if somebody is overweight and obese, they need to check their diabetic condition as early as possible to prevent these complications. It's very important. And if you see this, uh, the risk factors, yeah, we've got mainly two types of risk factors of diabetes. If you see the first one is non-modifiable risk factors, you can't change it. The other one is modifiable risk factor, you can change it. So like yeah, if you see the family history, you can't change it, age, you can't raise, and history of gestational diabetes. If somebody had gestational diabetes and that person will have possibility, at least 50% people with history of gestational diabetes, they become diabetic in the later life. And the other things, what you can change, like your physical inactivity, high body fat content or body weight, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. So these are the, some of the common risk factors of type two diabetes. You can change it by changing your lifestyle. And if you don't change your lifestyle, if you don't control this risk factor, so what can be happen? You may have, again, I'm telling this macro and microvascular complication. So what are the macrovascular complications? The you know, complication with a bigger or maybe a bigger blood vessel. So that's a normally called macrovascular complication. And whatever with the micro blood vessels, that's called macrovascular complication, particularly in the eyes and your kidneys and legs. And if your blood glucose concentration is high, so your the blood thickness is goes uh, go, gone up. So that is why that thick blood cannot reach in the every single part of your body. So blood normally supply our oxygen and nutrients. And if your blood cannot reach in a particular part of the body, so they cannot supply nutrients or oxygen. And ultimately those cells die. So that, that happens. So that to prevent the complication, we need to manage the gl blood glucose level. That is very important. And I'd like to tell you at least 50% people with diabetes, they suffer from one or two complications in their life. So if they already confirmed diabetic, they will suffer from at least one or two, I think 50% of them will suffer from at least one or two, or two of these complications. So why diabetes? My question is so why, you know, diabetes, if you see, and if you look at the other parts of the world, and if you look at the African situation from now till 2045, and the increment of diabetes from 2019 till 30, and to 45, the increment will be significantly high compared to the other parts of the world. And it is the highest is 143%. So compared to if you see the Europe or North America or Southeast Asia or Middle East. So that is why it's very important to work on this particular area of diabetes now to prevent this increment of diabetes or prevalence of diabetes in Africa. If you look at here in the continent wise, that's, even in the 2017 data, South Africa is sitting in the second position or leading second position uh, of the continent in terms of the diabetic patients in this continent. And if you look at also in 2015, 2016, published by the Statistics South Africa, and 
many times we focused on the particular you know, problems in the country like HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, but we don't look at like which one is the major causal factor for the death. And if you look at here, it's 2015 and 2016, the diabetes is the, major, is the second leading cause of death in South Africa, according to the statistics of South Africa. And although this data is old, and see this is the latest data published by one of my colleagues in Medical Research Council and recently published in 2021. What happens in terms of the type two diabetes? For example, if you see the prevalence of type two diabetes significantly increased by the age. When, when someone is like 25 to 35 or 34, so prevalence is like about 4%. And if it is going, for example, 35 to 44 is going up to 12% or something like that. Mm -hmm. And when the, you know, your age is going to 45 to 54, the prevalence is jumping to 20% plus. So you can imagine that is normally people say, and uh, diabetes is also called modial maturity onset di diabetes mellitus. So, and highest number is, and the highest prevalence is observed in this particular area. If you look at whether people have become 55, to 64 or greater than 65 is almost 30% people are suffering from type two diabetic in that particular age group. So it is, it is a serious matter. So that is why I think, as I told you before, my focus is on type two diabetes. And why animal model? Why animal models? The answer is very simple. For example, if we want to develop the new medicine, and if we want to understand the uh, you know, pathogenesis of the disease, and how it happens and what kind of cellular mechanism behind. So we must need to do like your thorough study in the different organs and different parts of the body. So that is why the animal models are very important because if I want to induce diabetes on anyone else's body, so that person will not be interested or they will not let me to induce diabetes in their body. And so that is the problem. So that is why we need to use animal model for the diabetes study. And the, that is the number one reason I told you, the human cannot be used as a disease model for the ethical reason. And to understand the rapidly changing pathogenesis of type two diabetes, because the pathogenesis of type two diabetes is rapidly changing. And if you want to understand, we need to use animal model because we can collect organs, all the organs and anything we want, we can collect from the animals after the treatment or after the induction of diabetes, so then we can understand the mechanism, how it happens. And not only that, also for the routine pharmacological screening of anti-type 2 diabetic drugs or anti-diabetic drugs, if we want to check whether something has anti-diabetic activity or not, and the understanding the mechanism of action. So the, all these reasons are clear that we need to use animal model uh, for our research. And why rats and mice, sometimes people ask me why we don't use any other animals. 85% of the your animal models used in the world are rats or mice. There are many reasons, because if you give anything to rats, they will eat. So that is why you call them omnivorous in nature. And they also tranquil behavior. For example, we use the animals that don't bite. So they're very quiet and calm and small in size. So they eat less that reduce the feeding cost and the experimental cost. So housing costs. So all these reasons why we use rats or mice for research, not like monkeys or pigs or that kind of things. So that is the reason. And what we did in our, we developed you know, quite a few animal model in previous years. And I think the one of our model is very popular in all over the world. And people are using in, in many countries. I'll show you the citation later. So what we did, for example, in our model, uh, we try to develop the two major pathogenesis of type two diabetes. One is insulin resistance and another is partial pancreatic beta cell dysfunction. And after that, if that animal model can sustain this pathogenesis for longer time, so they will automatically develop the other complications. So then we can use those animals as a model for human disease like diabetes to screen the anti-diabetic medicine or anti-diabetic food or supplements or whatever we want to do. And still, we can also check the your activity of a newly synthesized drugs on the diabetic complications. So that we did, but most of the time, people use the high fat diet and chemical diabetes inducer to develop the type two diabetes. But why we did not do that? The problem here 
in most of the developing countries, they don't have all kinds of food ingredients to make that special uh, high fat diet. And even we, we can make, then we need to collect many ingredients put together and we need a special feeding system. So that I could not find in many developing countries. So that is why finally we, we, we hypothesize how can you develop a model that can be developed in any developing countries in the world. And that is why you know, we develop a model that becomes so popular in, around the world and many countries they're using our model to screen the anti-diabetic food or supplement or diets or medicine. And so that is the reason. And we develop it because of these challenges, what I told you just now. And in 2010, I came here in 2008, but I originally started working in 2009. And this particular stu student, like Rachel Wilson, came to me and uh, wanted to work with me in, on diabetes. So we developed this uh, you know, uh, proposal or research proposal. And finally, we developed this model and what is published in those days in 2012 in the pharmacological reports. And we could find the your, you know, partial pancreatic beta cell dysfunction. And we also found our model is sensitive to the anti-diabetic drugs. And we could fulfill all the pathogenesis of type two diabetes in our model. And simply what we did, we simply fed animals 10% fructose solution for two weeks ad libitum. After that, we injected with a 40 milligram per kilogram body weight diabetes inducer that is called a streptozorosin. And we did many studies and we evaluated our model by doing many tests and we found our model sustained the blood glucose level from zero to 11 weeks, or you can say 12 weeks period. So that is the confirmation that our model was, you know, sus uh, sustained the blood glucose level for 12 weeks time. So that, that model can be used for the study or to study the diabetic complications. Because, and we need to understand this rats normally survive for a few years lifetime but humans survive for many years. So maybe the one year life in rats is equivalent to maybe 20 years in human. So if the 12 weeks you can compare that way is several years in humans. So this way, I think uh, we developed the model and we confirmed that this model can de develop the complication. And, and this model finally becomes so popular. And so far it is cited by 220 times in 2012. And not only that, from that model, we also got an invitation to write a book chapter in the published in the Methods in Molecular Biology. And that published from Springer Human Press in, uh, during that time in 2013, as I could remember. And also we did not stop here. Later, another one of another my student also developed another model and on non-obese type two diabetes because many people in the African and European countries, they're type two diabetic, but they're not obese. So we also developed another model. And this particular student also got award from the International Diabetes Federation to present his work in Melbourne, Australia in 2013. And not only that, you know, in the, after that, when you develop this model and our model becomes so popular and I, we got invitation from the it's Journal of Diabetes Research to develop a special issue on animal models. And then one scientist from University of Paris Diderot in France and in Kanajawa University in Japan, we all together, we develop a special issue on animal model of type two diabetes and we publish an editorial uh, during 2013. And also they invited me to visit in Paris in the University of Paris Diderot, this another colleague who is working on that animal model development uh, now. And if, if you see this, uh, we also developed, you see that our most cited paper is also on animal model of type two diabetes. Uh, we developed together with my host in the Northwest University and the cited for 263 times so far. And unfortunately this journal is discontinued, but it still it is citing. And we published also many other papers with another colleague from India in Hyderabad and many you know, models on diabetic neuropathy and pre-diabetes and non-genetic animal model in the uh, previous years. This another student recently developed a obese animal model of type two diabetes, but we did not publish it yet. So that we are planning to publish soon. So that is our another animal model we developed recently. So if you look at, you know, most of our top cited publication on animal model of type two diabetes, if you go to the Google Scholar and our trajectory is like this and all almost all of our publication 
on type 2 diabetes, they are top sided. And not only that, if you just go a little bit deeper, and if you look at the world ranking in animal models, and I think we are sitting in the fifth position in the world at the moment in terms of animal model development. So that's all about my animal model research. I think I want to tell a little bit about another area of research that is on anti-diabetic intervention trials uh, on uh, anti-diabetic sweetener or sweetener, you can say. So that is the one of the component we're using. If you go to the supermarket or discab, you will easily find it, Xylitol is very popular because it is an anti-diabetic, it is an anti-diabetic sweetener. Think about that, people, uh, diabetic people are scared to eat sweet. But if something sweet and anti-diabetic, so how, how, how good it is. So that is why we started to work on this particular sweetener, although we got many types of sweeteners, some natural sweeteners and some you know, alternative sweeteners, but natural sweeteners like sucrose, if you take more, you will be insulin resistant soon. And you look at the, how many sugar cubes in the per bottle of the Coke or can. So we can't eat that sugar because it can cause the insulin resistance and ultimately type two diabetes. So that is why we try to find something, we try to assess the anti-diabetic activity of the sweeteners and what happens on this. And because we don't like to use this sweetener, this cause obesity, overweight, insulin resistance, type two diabetes. So that is why we use Xylitol. Why? It got same sweetness like sugar, glycemic index is low like 13 and prevent, and they got many other benefits like your dental care is preventive or plaque formation preventive activity. How we started this research, for example, in those days in 2010, and this particular lady, I think that Ms. Babe Symes, who was supplying the sweet nothing xylitol in South Africa. And she came to me and proposed me whether we can assess the activity of xylitol in animals and see whether they're anti-diabetic or not. So we designed a very simple study with a normal control and xylitol and sucrose, only in few animals, in non-diabetic animals. And we found excellent result. Jalitol reduced blood glucose and also the improved glucose tolerance, reduced body weight and calorie intake, and finally published it in the Journal of Medicinal Food. But the problem here, what we found, we found the jalitol increased triglyceride level in the normal animals. So we are a little bit scared because this high triglyceride can also cause insulin resistance. So how can we uh, reduce that triglyceride? So that is why we designed, we, may, we are thinking maybe this in the normal animals. It, um, and the effect of xylitol may not be the same exactly in the diabetic animals. So that is why we designed another study in type two diabetic animals with a similar design. And this time we got similar effect, but if you see, we did not see the increment of triglyceride in type two diabetic animals. Then we are, you know, maybe something like urecolite situation, the xylitol, uh, may increase the triglyceride in normal animals, but not in type two diabetic animals. So that is why we, although we published that paper quickly and this work was done by one of my honors student and we published in the Annals of Nutrition and Metabolism. And later we also published another letter to the editor like Xylitol increases serum trick triglyceride in normal, but not in a type two diabetes model of rats. So that published also in the same journal quickly. The later we wanted to understand the, your mechanism of action. Uh, per, firstly, we wanted to understand the what dose of xylitol is the most effective. Is 2.5% or 5% or 10%. So we did another dose response study during uh, published in 2014. And we found in all the factors, we found the 10% dose of xylitol was the effective for the reducing blood glucose level and also improving your glucose tolerance and also reducing the cholesterol. But the problem here, if you see again, and I'm still not convinced and I'm still thinking about it. So why xylitol is increasing triglycerides? It's simple because xylitol is, is a polyalcohol, so polyols that can bind with the free fatty acid and simply convert it to triglyceride and increase the triglyceride level. So from now, our one of the you know objective to see how can we add something to Xylitol uh, to reduce the triglyceride level to make it more effective and because it is an anti-diabetic sweetener and is available in the market. And we published this work, it's done by one of my postdoctoral fellows, uh, Dr. Raman. And later we also, the, another student, I think who did a lot of work on sugar alcohols, he also did a lot of you know, mechanism of action of Xylitol 
and how it reduces blood glucose level. It's like it inhibits the enzyme, the carbohydrate digesting enzyme inhibitory activity, also reduce the gastric emptying time. For example, if you eat food with xylitol, it takes time to go out from your stomach to intestine and also increase the digestive transit. That means when it is entering from stomach to intestine, it goes out quickly from the intestine. So there's shorter digestive transit and increase muscle glucose uptake, decrease small intestinal glucose absorption, and ultimately, you know, the decrease the glucose absorption in the different segment of the small intestinal tract. Like you know, we did also study in the different segment of the small intestinal tract. And we also found the pancreatic beta cell improving activity of gelatol. And that also helps to improve the insulin secretion. And this is where gelatol works to reduce the blood glucose level. And finally, this work we published in the Food and Function, a Royal Society Journal published from UK. And this particular student, the Chica, who did a lot of work with sugar alcohols later during his PhD study. And because of our, you know, a lot of work on Jayaditol, we also got invitation from a Springer to write a book chapter. And we wrote a book chapter like Jayaditol, One Name, Numerous Benefits, and published in 2018. Not only that, and because of our work uh, on Jayaditol, there's another research group in Switzerland, those who also work the clinical trials of Jayaditol and another sugar alcohol, erythritol, uh, in, in humans. And they invited me to uh, visit them as a visiting associate professor. So we also did a lot of work together uh, in clinical uh, in, during 2017 till, till now. And one of this work like published in the you know, clinical reviews in food science and nutrition. And to continue this work, my another PhD student who just uh, PhD accepted recently, and she also contributed significantly in this area of research. And if you'd like to see some of this research, like one paper we published recently in the Journal of Food and Drug Analysis is contributed by two of my students. And it has been downloaded from all over the world about 2000 times since March this year. So the work is getting popularity and we also got invitation from another Chinese medical university like Tianjin Medical University to work together on this particular area of research. So I think this way, I think our work getting popular around the world and we are continuing and getting interest to work on this particular area of research. And I'd like to tell uh, the few slides, uh, two or three slides on this particular topic, like many of us, you know, those who are joining here, the like artificial sweetener is very popular around the world. And like your sucralose, aspartam, uh, stevia, cyclamate, saccharin, and recently we did some study on artificial sweeteners and two of my students work on this particular area, one on non-diabetic animals and another on diabetic animals. When we did the study on non-diabetic animals, we found this result and which one is the best and which one is the worst. And if you look this, we found the cyclamate containing artificial sweetener was the worst and stevia containing artificial sweetener showing the best effect. And that is confirmed again, when you did a study in the type two diabetic animals and you see the green one is for the stevia and stevia reducing like alkaline phosphatase, cholesterol or HDL or LDL cholesterol. Uh, HDL is normal, but LDL cholesterol was significantly reduced and triglyceride, there's a major concern was not increased as well. So that is why so far I found, you know, stevia is a natural sweetener. Apart from xylitol, stevia is one of the popular or anti-diabetic sweetener you can prefer to use uh, in your daily life. And I think there's, uh, although we got many, you know, uh, mechanism of anti-diabetic drugs, we get it from the market, but there's uh, all of them got one of, I think the most uh, long-term or short-term side effects. So that is why many of my students focusing on African medicinal plants, like uh, I'm showing now this one of my PhD student and the, all of my PhD students I'm displaying here, they work in these particular plants. I think uh, all of them are graduated in the recent year. So this is one of my very, you know, so like productive PhD student who work on this particular palm wine and that came in the news media in around the world, in South Africa and other African countries recently. And there's another student also work with some other medicinal plant and it's very difficult for me to present all this year. So this recently graduated another student. Now we are working with the pure compounds and we found some excellent results and we published in the internationally reported journals. 
So this another Chinese student who worked on South African and Chinese tea, and we found this red ribose, uh, sorry, red honeybush tea and jasmine green tea was the best for the diabetes from our study recently. And uh, I'd like to see my lab members now. This is my student at the moment. This is a recent picture, picture from the animal house. And I want to conclude it here uh, because of the time, I think I want to tell you the lack of education is one of the better problem for the prevalence of diabetes. Number of undiagnosed cases, more than 50% people are diabetic. They don't know they're diabetic. So it's very important to test your diabetic situation or condition to know whether you are diabetic or not. High prevalence of overweight and obesity, particularly in the school children now, if we kind of stop in the school children, so at least 50% of the school children, they, uh, they grow as an overweight and obese adult, and they ultimately become type 2 diabetics. So it's, we need to start from the school to stop the obesity and stop the type 2 diabetes. Lack of nutritional knowledge is another reason. And we eat the westernized food like fast food and rapid urbanization is another issue. The sedentary lifestyle, for example, you're sitting all the time, so no physical activity. So that kind of things contribute significantly to increase the prevalence of type two diabetes, gestational diabetes and macrosomia, for example, if a lady is a, a, a diabetic in, during the pregnancy and got a bigger baby. So they both of them got chance to be diabetic in future in the adult life. So uncontrolled or ignored hyperglycemia, for example, our blood glucose level is high, but we ignore it sometimes. We don't control it, we don't manage it. And ultimately we get a lot of complications and lack of understanding of 3D concept. What is the 3D concept? 3D concept is simply, if you have diabetes, you need to follow three things, diet, discipline, and drugs. So you need to follow this 3D concept to manage it. So my last one here, the expensive newly developed anti-diabetic drugs, that many people cannot afford it. So that is why the prevalence of diabetes is increasing and with a high prevalence in the African countries possibility in the following years. So lastly, I think I'm almost at the end of my talk. I think uh, I don't want to take a lot of time. These are my postdoctoral fellows and my PhD student, those who have graduated already, and the MSc student, those who are graduated and honors student, those who are graduated, I think these already you know, said by, you know, Professor Olinera. And uh, scholarship and fellowship and award recently. And I also like to tell you the people, those who are behind me to bring me here today to make me a full professor in the University of Puzzle Natal. So these are my mentors, those who affected, uh, I think that's uh, boost me significantly, encouraged me and, you know, supported me in the previous years to become a full professor. And also these are my local co collaborators, those who helped me to do research together, to publish together, and you're still continuing with the research. And these are my international collaborators from different parts of the world. And these are my funding organization from South Africa. And lastly, I think I'd, I want to tell you last one, and this is the person is a professor in British University who brought me to South Africa and from the airport. And he is the person who motivated me to come here in South Africa. And he's the person who brought me from the airport to home. And uh, the first day of my life in South Africa, 31st of October, 2006. And I'd like to show this, these are my parents, my father and my mother. And my father passed away in 2011. And my mother also visited South Africa recently, a couple of years ago, and my father could not. And lastly, and but not least my family, those who are always behind me and supporting me and my family is growing here from the smaller children to bigger one in South Africa. So I think this is my last slide. And thank you very much for all of your attention. And I also would like to thank the Bangladeshi community in Durban who is supporting me from behind all the times to do research. So thank you very much for your kind attention and patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Islam, for that excellent inaugural lecture that you presented. Um, it's interesting for us to see um, your areas of research and to also see your great achievements over the years, and especially the contributions that your research group are making. 
um, within the international community. So well done and congratulations. Um, we are very proud of you. Uh, you must know that. And we're very proud of all your academic achievements and all the accolades you have um, acquired over the years. And we thank you for flying the flag of the University of KwaZulu-Natal high and higher. And thank you for also flying the flags of the School of Life Sciences high everywhere you go. So we're grateful. We thank you for the, uh, for, for the presentations. We also want to uh, thank, although you've thanked them, but I think on behalf of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, it's important for us to also thank all the postgraduate students that we've worked with over the years who have contributed significantly uh, towards the development of the animal model that come from your lab and that have taken the research to a greater height over the years and have resulted into the numerous publications that have come from your lab. We will also want to express a vote of thanks to all the collaborators you've worked with, uh, both locally and internationally and all the mentors that you show on your last slide uh, that you have uh, that have played one role or the other in terms of your academic career uh, during, during your journey. Um, we also want to say thanks to all the colleagues uh, that attended this inaugural lecture. Um, we, I'm sure that everyone uh, were very keen to listen to you, and I'm sure that everyone have learned one or two things in terms of diabetes and how that can be managed. And thank you for choosing this area of research because of the service you wanted to do uh, for the humanity, uh, humanities. So thank you very much. And lastly, I will want to also say thank you to your family on behalf of the university. Um, I know they share you with us. I know many a times you have to spend long hours in the lab and in doing those research and doing your teaching at the university. So I want to say thank you to, to your wife and, and children for sparing you with us and sharing you with us and giving us time um, to be able to, to, to be with you. And we want to wish you all the best um, in your future endeavors and in everything that you do. We hope that you will continue to uh, make good progress and we hope that you will continue to achieve uh, even more um, as you go along in terms of academic career. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you everyone for joining.